Hello there, brethren there in Hong Kong, Kalinga Group. I especially greet you at this time of this pandemic, the highest peak of the uh, ever of the great tribulation and the rapture is just around the corner. I exhort you to be strong, stand firm in faith, fight the good fight because Jesus is coming very soon. May God bless you. I wish I were there with you to sing my song. Ucaya katok cika chong la Som samoko kalayun un awad siya Aunit taylak anan pita Ucaya katok cika chong la I, I wish I can remember the rest of the lyrics, but I long to be there. May God bless you. Hoping to see you someday. If not, we see each other in the Eastern Gate. God bless you again. Hello there. I am glad to give you this message uh, for your anniversary, wherever you are, whether for northern europe or for canada or for asia i'd like to preach this uh, message to you at this time again uh, it's very important because i'm giving you a this divine revelation which is uh, very important the bible says without revelation my people perish so i'm giving you revelation I'd like to remind you all that uh, all that I am teaching from the beginning of my ministry when God called me until now are all through divine revelations. I could not teach any theological revelation because I have not gone through theology or even Bible school. So the only thing that I can give you are divine revelations that God has given to me to teach you. Like God, every time he wanted to talk to his people, Israel, while they came out of Egypt, he always called Moses to the top of Mount Sinai and would tell Moses exactly what Moses has to tell the people. And that's what I am doing even until now. So, I'd like to talk to you uh, based on our uh, theme this year, and this year, this, the theme this year is an end-time theme that you can find in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. <clears throat> and I'd like to read to you, uh, Paul wrote Timothy and said, Fight the good fight of the faith. Fight the good fight of the faith. It is not a faith, it is the faith. In other words, it is a particular kind of faith. It is just not. It is not just any faith. Mm -hmm. I'd like to tell you that the faith of man is not pleasing to God. What is faith? Faith is believing. Okay, but the believing of man is limited to his senses. In other words, men do not believe unless. A matter or a thing or an event or anything appeals to his senses. Kaya meron pagsasabi na no see, no believe. Saan kita, saan padi. Okay? And that is the kind of believing of human believing, man's believing. And the Bible says that kind of believing is God compares it to filthy rags. It is as filthy rags. What is filthy rags? Mabaho, nanisnis, very odorous, very abhorring to God. And God hates it. So God hates our kind of human believing. What is pleasing to God is faith. The kind of faith that comes from God. 
Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says that faith comes it is a consequence it says in Romans 10 17 consequently faith comes how does it come by hearing the message what kind of message from the words of Christ you see that is how that faith comes it is not original in man and that is why people cannot be saved through a faith or various kinds of you see the, the churches have different kinds of faith they they base their faith on their theology what is theology study about god theo is a god logy is a study like biology study about bio, about uh, the human body uh, the systems of the scientific body sociology a study about the social behaviors human social behaviors the same thing with theology study about god but who makes the study man and he uses his intellect his human intellect, his human wisdom, and he makes a conclusion after his study. And that is why the churches of Jesus Christ today have different, different theologies. In fact, some, they do not agree in many things. There's only one word of God from which they try to study God. But it's all, it all results in theology, the conclusion, the study of man about God. And that is why this kind of theology, this kind of, of uh, study of God, the Word of God, does not bring that faith that can save. We are, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, we are saved through faith. Salvation is a gift, it's free. Uh, we are, it's uh, by grace. Okay. Grace is a free gift of God. Our salvation is a free gift of God, but we can only avail it. We can only avail of that free salvation through faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. All right? And what is that faith? It has to be that faith that comes. Where does it come from? It comes from God because it is the faith of God. Faith is one of the spirits of God. You will find that in your Bible. And that is one of the spirits of God. That's one of the characters of the Holy Spirit. That's why when man is, does not get filled with the Holy Spirit, he does not have that faith that comes. And so all the people who are studying God from His Word without the Holy Spirit, there is no faith that comes from God. It comes. It arrives to us. It is not original in us. It's not original through our human intellect and uh, capacity or ability. So, that is what I would like to discuss with you today. Paul says to Timothy, fight the good fight of the faith. Okay? So, what is, what is the particular thing now we need to talk about it is about faith because it is that faith that gives us salvation it is that faith that we have gained eternal life that's why he continues to say take hold of the eternal life to which you were called so we were called to eternal life by God when God called us and gave us his faith it came to us then we receive that eternal life, that salvation. So God, Paul is saying, take hold, hold on to it, don't let go. Hmm? Don't let go, don't release. Huh? Hold tight to it, hold on to it, to that salvation, to that eternal life to which you were called. When you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In other words, after you received it, you have experienced the salvation, you have experienced the goodness of God, you have, good, you have experienced the blessings of God. 
of that eternal life, that salvation, you started to testify to people by confessing to people about God, what God has done in your life. You made that confession in the presence of many witnesses. So you see, confession is also very basic and very important. We need to confess. We need to tell the good news. We need to inform others. That's why we have to be active. That is how God is going to make us fruitful. How we can encourage one another. Especially, you know, it says, he says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, especially as you see the day of the Lord approaching now. So it's an end time message. All right? So what we are going to discuss is about that faith. Now, faith is the main factor. It is the main ingredient. It is the main reason for salvation. We are saved through faith. Now, to further discuss about faith, James chapter 2 verse 17 says, Faith without action is dead. So, if your faith is dead, it cannot save. It cannot avail salvation. It cannot avail eternal life. It cannot avail the blessings of God. It cannot avail the miracles. It cannot avail the goodness of God. Because it is dead. What makes it dead? The, the James 2.17 says, Faith by itself alone. Even if you believe in your mind and in your heart, and you say you believe, but you do not put any action to your believing, that faith is dead. It cannot be effective. It has no effect. It is not effective. And so, we need to discuss this. That is how we are going to fight the good fight. It says, fight the good fight of the faith. So if you do not put action to your faith, then you are not fighting the good fight. Okay? Very simple. I would like to go as simple as that, step by step. Okay? And what is the action that is needed for us to maintain that eternal life, that salvation, the goodness of God, the blessings of God? in our lives. We need salvation every day. We do not salvation only. We do not need salvation one shot deal and you think you are always saved. That's why look at the people who think that once they are saved, they are always saved. But accidents come. Hmm? Death comes. Uh, misfortunes come anyway. Why? Because we need salvation every day. Why do we need it every day? Because every day, the devil is always going around, around, around us, ready to devour, ready to perform his duty that God has given. What is the duty of the devil? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10. That's the duty of the devil. And so that is the reason why we need salvation every day. And how do we have that salvation? We need faith. Because we are saved through faith. In fact, the Bible says, faith is a shield against the fiery darts of the devil. The devil is always throwing fiery darts at us to kill us, to destroy us. Every day he's always roaming and roaming, ready for a chance to devour you, to destroy you, to steal everything, anything that you have, to steal even your happiness, even your joy, to steal your health. He puts in COVID-19. He is to steal even your belongings like he did to Job, to steal and kill your family members like he did to the children of Job, to steal and kill and destroy Job when he gave him his sickness to kill him. That's all the job of the devil. 
and he's always ready going around us, every one of us, ready to perform his duty. And how do we need, how do we gain that salvation against the fiery darts of the evil one? Satan said to God, how can I touch your servant, Job? When you have put a hedge around him, what is a hedge? A fence, see, a protection. What is that hedge? His faith. And so faith is a hedge. Faith is a defense. Faith is a shield against the fiery darts of the evil one. Faith is what we need to have salvation from God against the devil so that the devil cannot destroy us. The devil cannot steal. The devil cannot kill. When we have that faith, very strong faith. But again, it is that faith. It is a particular kind of faith. It is not the kind of believing of man. It is not even the kind of believing through theology. It is not the kind of believing of any kind of believing. It has to be the believing of God that comes and it is a free gift. To us you cannot uh, even if you are an intellectual and you can discuss and debate about the Bible it, that's not the faith it will not help you it will not even defend you from the devil okay so the theme today says fight the good fight of the faith what is the faith that is the faith of God the faith the believing of God, it is not the faith of man. That is the believing of man, the human believing. No, it is the faith of God. And Romans 10, 17 says, that faith comes. I have to stress this because of the different theologies, the people think they just believe a little bit and they are saved and they are permanently saved forever. And they, they base it on, they think it's the grace of God. I'll tell you, faith comes. It has to be that particular faith, the faith of God that comes to us. And we need to fight that kind of faith. We have to fight with that kind of faith. Fighting the good fight of the faith. Hallelujah. Okay? So, I'd like to go a little further. What is the faith what does it entail when you that faith of God comes? It comes when a man hears the message. Romans 10 verse 17. Faith consequently comes by hearing the message. That is why Jesus himself who was God in the beginning and became a man in order to come and exemplify the process of salvation. Salvation is a process. Salvation is not a one-shot deal. And he came to perform and to show and do the example of that process. That is why he became a man. And he heard the message of John the Baptist. When he was going to start his ministry, he had to go through this process himself as a man. He heard the message. He went to hear the message of John the Baptist who started to preach around the Jordan. And when he heard that message, the faith, Romans 10, 17 says, came, comes. He was not the only one. He was among the multitudes of people who listened to the message of John the Baptist. And Jesus had to go through this process as a man. And the faith came. And when that faith came, they believed. And because they believed, that faith is believing. That faith of God comes. And they believed without doubt. They believed in God that He's Almighty to save. And they put the action. What is the action that in, it entailed them to do? John the Baptist is preaching in Matthew chapter 3, Repent for the kingdom 
of God is near. Kingdom of heaven is near. Kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God, but that is the kingdom of God in heaven. And the kingdom of God on earth is another. It is part of the whole kingdom of God, and all believers become part of the kingdom of God here on earth when they believe in Jesus Christ. But it is another step to reach the kingdom of heaven. It's another step to become a member of the kingdom of heaven, even if you are already a member of the kingdom of earth. Okay? And so the first step, the first action is believing. And when you believe, the first action, of course, is listening to the message. The second action, according to Matthew chapter 3, is repent. When you hear, you are convicted by the message, then you must have repentance. Repentance is not only an attitude. It's not only feeling sorry for your sin or having been sinful or having committed sin. Repentance, that's only one step of repentance, to feel sorry about it. But repentance includes the action to, the decision to make, to stop that, this, that sin, to stop that bad action that you have been doing, that you are doing, to change it into righteousness, to become obedient to the Word of God, to the commands of God. And that is repentance. So, after feeling, after hearing the message, and you are convicted, then you need to repent. You need to, how do you repent? You have to humble yourself and admit your sinfulness. Admit your sin. And admitting your sin, John the Baptist, chapter 3 says, the people came and they confessed their sins. Confessing it. Confessing is admission. Admitting that you are a sinner. Admitting to your, admitting your sin. Admitting the wrong things that you have done. And willing to be changed. Willing to change. That is repentance. Willing to turn about. To return to the normal. To return to what is right. From wrong to right. That is repentance. Now, what is the action of repentance? What does John, what does Matthew chapter 3 say, like Jesus did after he came and he heard the message? Like all the people, they all came and heard the message and they confessed their sins. And they were baptized by John in the river Jordan. So baptism is a very, very basic fundamental action that the Bible teaches us which even Jesus himself, the Son of God, who has become a man, had to go through and had to perform as an example for all men who believe. They must, we must follow Jesus. And he was baptized. You find that in Matthew chapter 3. Okay? That is the first step of repentance. What is, what is actually baptism? Uh, you go again to Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, it teaches us that baptism is an action of death, being buried in baptism. Romans chapter 6, it says, We were therefore buried with Him, with Jesus Christ. We were naisali tayo. We were included with Jesus Christ. We were included with Him. We were buried with Him in His burial, in His death and burial through baptism. Okay? So, when you are baptized, you are buried into the earth and water is part of the earth. That's why we are buried through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. We also rise into a new life. And that is what is born again. We were 
born out of the water. You came out of the bag of water when we were born into this world. Now we are again buried into water and then we come out of the water. That is the grave. And like Jesus was buried, but he rose again and have a new life. Ja, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism. So, baptism is the action that goes with faith. All of these are the action. If when you have faith after believing, hearing the message, then faith comes. Conviction comes. The Holy Spirit, the spirit of faith comes and pricks your heart with conviction. And then you become willing to repent. You become sorry of your sin. And you admit your sin and you confess and you become sorry. And you become willing to change, willing to turn away from your sinfulness. That is repentance. And the action that God looks for, not what the theology and theologians, a lot of theologians even think that baptism is not, is not important. But baptism according to Jesus in the Bible is very basic, very important. He says in Mark chapter chapter 16, verse 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. In verse 15, he says, Go and preach the good news to all creation. In verse 16, He who believes, when you go to preach and share the good news, He who believes and is baptized, will be saved. So baptism is a very basic and fundamental requirement in the process of salvation. It is an action that goes with faith. That is why that's why James chapter 2 verse 17 says, faith by itself without action is dead. We have to put and we have to accompany it with action. And the action, the first step of action that goes with faith is repentance which is fulfilled through baptism okay after this repentance we need there more action which is the action we're talking about is obedience to the words of God that is the action that goes with faith in order to maintain in order to establish that salvation and maintain it. What is salvation? It is a relationship with God. It is the original relationship of Adam and Eve with God, which was broken. It was broken when the devil came and they, instead of believing God only and obeying Him and doing the duties that God has commanded them to do, to take care of the garden, to work it, and to take care of it. They obeyed the devil. They believed the devil and obeyed the devil. So the relationship of man was cut off. Napotol. Huh? So man is no longer related with God. He is now related with the devil whom he has followed from the time of Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden. That's why the devil has stolen, has grabbed, he has seized man, and not only man, the kingdom of God, which is the earth, which God created. And so the devil is now the ruler of this world, from that time on until now. And that's why, as we study the Bible, God is going to destroy this earth, including man. The whole of this earth, including humanity. He started doing it first when he punished this earth with the flood of Noah. But again, after the flood of Noah, sin continued to flourish and perpetrated until now. That's why, but God promised not to destroy this earth again, not to punish and destroy this earth with water, which that's why. The Bible teaches that God made the rainbow as a sign of His promise. Not to destroy again with water, with a flood. Whenever it rains, then you see the rainbow. Okay? But He's going to destroy this earth with fire. 
and there's his coming judgment that God is going to do. But before he destroys this earth with fire, he will have to save his people who followed his son Jesus, whom he sent. He sent his word and his word became flesh, became human being in the person of Jesus. And all those who believe in Jesus Christ, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. But those who believe in him are given the right to become children of God. And John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will be saved, will have eternal life, will not perish, but will have eternal life. And so we need to follow Jesus. And all the action that Jesus did when he started to believe the message that he heard from John the Baptist. And what was one of the actions he did? He submitted for baptism as a action to fulfill the repentance that you're willing to die for your faith. You're willing to die for following Christ. You are included with Jesus Christ in his suffering and in his death and in his burial. So Romans 6, 3, uh, uh, forces we were included with him in his his death and burial so that we might rise like him we also rise and live a new life and that is we become a new creation we become a new person again we become a recreated person we become born again we have gone through the first birth and we became we were wicked in this world but we need to be born again is in the spirit in order to live a new life okay now so what is the second action and this is what i'm going to tell you we can see that when god we have to go back to the beginning when god created man he created first the whole earth and everything all the animals the birds and the fish and the sea and the rivers and all those things and then he planted a garden and then he, the last creation that he created was the man. And God planted a garden. It says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. And I'd like to read it to you. Verse 8. After creating everything, the word of God says in verse 8, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east. So I'd like you to understand that God is the one who planted the garden. It was not the man. It is God who planted the garden in the east. What is that east? We can see that the boundaries of this garden of Eden is actually, this garden of Eden is actually Palestine. That is what God has promised to the heirs of Abraham. And uh, the boundaries are there, the Gihon, the Tigris, and the Euphrates, they are all there, okay? And it says in verse 8, God planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. So you see, it was not the man who planted the garden. It was God who planted the garden. And then he took the man and he put him in that garden. Now in verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden, what is he going to do? To work it and take care of it. So that is the job of the man. To work the garden and to take care of it. What does work mean? He is a laborer of God. He is a servant of God to labor and to work the garden of God. Okay. And the second responsibility of man is to take care of the garden. To take care of the garden. Okay. I'd like to tell you this divine is a divine revelation from the word of God. The very truth, God planted a garden for man, even to us today. What is the garden? It is the work that we that God gives us. And what is that garden? It is the source of our livelihood. 
That's why in the next verse, in verse 17, verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man. It's a commandment. This is not just a mere statement. It is a command. He said, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Hallelujah. You can eat the fruit of any tree in the garden. So today, I want to make this revelation to you now that it is God who gave us our garden. Whether you are a farmer of the soil, like Cain, or you are a farmer of animals, animal husbandry, like, like uh, Abel, the brother of Cain, or you are a, a, a businessman, uh, you had money and capital to, to start a business, that's your garden, the garden. Uh, whether you are an employee of the government or a private corporation, that is your garden. It was God who made that garden. Okay? You have never, we all came out to this, into this world naked and without nothing. And we shall take out anything. Not, we will not be able to take out anything when we leave this world. That is what the Bible says. So all of these things are God-given. And it's God who gave your garden like God gave the garden to Adam. And the same thing today. We are all Adam. Adam means man. And he gave you a garden. And he authorized you to eat from any tree in that garden. So in other words, you work this garden, you take care of this garden, and then you are free to eat. To eat is your food. It is your compensation. It is your remuneration. When you work that garden and you take care of that garden, you are free to eat. It's a commandment of God. That's why He gave us the leeway and the allowance to eat and spend our income that we got, that we gather from our employments or from our work or from our our farm or from our field or okay or vocation or occupation okay we are free to eat verse 16 but in verse 17 chapter 2 of genesis verse 17 it says god says but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when you eat of it, you will surely die. What does that mean? Okay, I have given you, I planted my garden, I planted it all with all kinds of trees, all kinds of plants for your food. Huh? And I have given you the, uh, I commanded you, you can eat from any of all of this. You are free to eat, you are free to spend. But, that tree in the center of the garden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why is it called the tree of the good knowledge of good and evil? Because God already informed the man that it is evil to eat of it. It is not good. It's bad to eat. Why? Because you will surely die. That's why it's called the knowledge of, the, of good and evil. It is good if you harvest it and give it to the owner. God said, this tree is mine. This, the fruit of this tree is mine. I've given you all to eat from any tree, but the fruit of this is mine, so do not eat it. Just harvest it and give it to me because it's mine. And do not eat because if you eat what belongs to me, you are robbing me. It is mine, it's not yours. You are robbing me, and if you eat of it, you become a criminal in the kingdom of God, and you will surely die. What is die? What is death? Death is separation from God. Separation from God. That is why when Adam and Eve ate that fruit of that tree, they became separated from God. They were became dead spiritually. Na potol ang relationship nila sa Panginoon. The relationship was cut off. It was broken. And they are considered dead. That is why every man on earth is considered dead until 
that relationship is restored then you become live and how is that that how is that life this restored when the giver of life which is the holy spirit comes to you see without the holy spirit there is no life with the holy spirit there is life that's why when jesus will come this time when he will come soon he is coming to judge the quick or the live and the dead and the church this the church that is going to be judged this time and the church is composed of live or quick and dead i want to tell you you see in matthew chapter 25 how he will gather the nations all believers from all nations nations means people and he will put some on the left and he will put some on the right to those on his right they are the quick they are the live and he'll say enter and inherit the kingdom that has been prepared from you from the beginning but what will he say to those on his left you who are cursed go into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels find that in Matthew chapter 25 somewhere in verse 40 41 something like that hmm. so there will be many Christians who call him Lord that's why he says not everyone who says to me Lord Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven Matthew 7 21 many will belong to the left of Jesus when he comes and gather the nations and they say Lord we do not worship you we were even filled with the Holy Spirit we performed many miracles but he will say I don't know you you evildoers why well, evildoers sinful what is evil doer doing evil what is evil doing disobedience to the words of God sin is disobedience to the commands of God so what is the command of God do not right now from the very beginning from the beginning of the Bible when God created man and he put him in his garden he already commanded him this very very basic command very basic unang unang batas ng Panginoon sa tao to maintain that relationship wag mong kainin ibibigay ko I give you all the fruits for your food and your maintenance working and taking care of my garden but do not eat that fruit that belongs to me that's the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. And said, so that is how you will maintain your life. Do not, so that you will not die. You I give you all the food, the, the fruits for your food, so you will continue to live. But if you eat that fruit that belongs to me, you will surely die. What does it mean? You will surely be cut off from me. Our relationship will be cut off. Okay? And that is what exactly happened to man when Adam and Eve ate the fruit that was forbidden by God they were cut off and they were became sinful and they became subservient to the devil the devil became their boss no longer their creator and their father and all the generations after Adam and Eve like Cain he did not give the best so he became Abel gave the best and he was prosperous and Abel became jealous and he killed his brother see now now we go to the fulfillment today from the beginning of the Bible up to the end of the Bible of the Jews the people of God you know the Bible the people of God the Jews is the Old Testament and before he ended the Old Testament he commanded in Malachi Malachi chapter 3 and this is you take it as a very very this is a usual uh, exhortation you know this is not just an exhortation for giving listen to me this is a divine revelation all the theologians use it for exhortation for giving I tell you if you are a free believer you need to know the exact truth the precise truth of this commandment of God when he commanded man Adam and Eve do not eat that fruit 
If you do, you will surely die. I give you all the fruits of the garden for you to eat. So he gave us a garden and we are free to spend and eat the fruit of our labor in the garden of God that he has provided us. But we are prohibited from the share of God in that garden. And that is the forbidden fruit. And in Malachi, it is the tithe. Very clear, very clear. Okay, let us read chapter 3. God speaks in chapter 3 of Malachi. Verse, uh, starting from verse 6. Verse 6, he says, I, the Lord, do not change. Hindi ako nagbabago. My love has never changed. Uh, even if you became even if you became very sinful, very, I still love you. That's why God loves even in the most wicked person. He wants to save because they are his creation. They belong to him. It is not the devil who created man. Okay? And he says, so you, all descendants of Jacob, who are the descendants of Jacob? The Israelites. But we Christians are now the modern Israelites. We are also part of of the offsprings of Israel according to Revelation chapter 12. Because Jesus who founded Christianity is a Jew. He is among the descendants of Jacob. And he says, so you all descendants of Jacob are not destroyed because I never changed. My love never changed. And then in verse 7, God makes the accusation to man. He says, ever since the time of your forefathers who were our forefathers the first forefathers is adam and eve and the next four forefathers are cain and abel and the next forefathers so forth and so forth and god says ever since the time of your forefathers you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them magmula sa Unang unang mga ninuno ninyo. You have desecrated, you have disobeyed my commands, my decrees. Sinuway ninyo ang aking mga batas and have not kept them. And that is the reason why our relationship, God is talking, that's the reason why our relationship was cut off na potol ang ating religion. You became related to the devil who is bad and evil. And that's why you became evil, you became sinful because he became your father. But God here in this chapter 3 in, in the same verse, verse uh, 7, makes a proposition, gives a condition for reconciliation for the restoration of the relationship of God and man. What does he say? Return to me. Magbalik kayo sa akin. You come back to me. Why does he say return to me? Because you have gone away. It was man who first turned away from God and followed the devil. And that's why he says, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. What is he saying? Return to me and I will return to you and our relation, our broken relationship will be restored. Let us restore. Let us reconcile and restore our broken relationship. And this is a message to every man from the beginning from Adam and Eve until now. This is the condition of God. In other words, when Jesus came here, and John the Baptist said, repent, repent and come back. Repent from your sins. Repent from your having turned away from me. Return to me and I will return to you. Let us restore our relationship. And that's why I discussed earlier the conditions of that Jesus came to perform. There is that repentance and that decision to come back to God. And the first step is repentance. It's a process up to baptism. And that baptism is not only a baptism with water for repentance, including baptism with the Holy Spirit, because 
It is only when the Holy Spirit comes that you become alive again. You were dead when you ate that fruit. When man disobeyed God, man became dead. But we have to restore our relationship with God and He will give life again. How? When the Holy Spirit, the seal of God of ownership, the seal of ownership of God over man. Okay, we need to be baptized not only with water, but with the Holy Spirit. And then life will come. And then we need to continue to, to accompany our faith with action. What is now the action that God is looking for that will accomplish the restoration of this broken relationship? God says, return to me and I will return to you. But you ask, but you man, you ask, how do we return? You see, man is ignorant. He does not know how to return. Until now, even theologians do not know how to return. They think that process, believing a little bit only, even if you don't get baptized, even if you don't pay tithe, you are saved. You see? But here's God talking. And listen to me. God says, return to me and I return to you. Ask, how do we return? And God says, why will a man rob God? You have been robbing me from the time we were forefathers. You have robbed, been robbing me and you are still robbing me, but you rob me. And people still say, but you ask, how do we rob you? See? Man is ignorant. Even theologians are ignorant. And this is in tithes and offerings. This is where you are robbing me. The fruit that I have forbidden, that is part of the fruit of my garden that I have given to you to work and to take care so that you will have a livelihood, you have a source of food for you to be able to maintain your life. You have been robbing me in tithes and offerings. How have we been robbing you? Tithes and offerings. From the time of your forefathers until now. And that's why he says in verse 9, uh, you are under a curse. That's why you, as the whole nation, are under a curse. You are a suffering a curse. Whose curse? The curse of God. You are suffering. What is the curse? The wages of sin is death. God has stated the curse already in the, in the Bible. Sin, disobedience is death. So when they disobeyed that command of God and did not, that ate what God had prohibited, they became dead. You see, death, wages of sin is death. So when you disobey, death. Sin, the wages of sin is death. So he says, you are serving the curse. The whole nation of you because you are robbing me. You see, very specific. God is very specific here. I don't know. If you study the word of God and you have understanding, common sense will tell you what is God telling. Let us restore. Let us reconcile. Let us restore our broken relationship. How do we restore? Bring, verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Dalhim in you, bring the whole. Don't bring less. It has to be whole. It must be complete. 10%, not less. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And he says, there is a blessing. You know, this blessing is only a bonus. The first is restoration of the broken relationship. That's the important thing. And when you get restored and related as a son or a child of God, the blessings will come. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings that you will not have room enough for it. You see, this is a promise of God. It's God talking. Test me when you... Restore your obedience to my command that you have broken. And that is not to eat the fruit, the forbidden fruit. 
instead of eating it, you repent and you bring it now. You fulfill now my command, which your forefathers from the time of your you have been disobeying. But restore it now. Bring the whole tithe to my storehouse and see if I will not even reward you with blessings. I will open the floodgates of heaven. Floodgates overflowing. You cannot control it. You will have no room enough for it. I will prevent the pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruits. The Lord says the Lord Almighty. It's God doing the Lord Almighty. Then the nations will, will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land. The nations, the people will see what I'm doing for you. The blessings I'm giving you. The salvation that I'm not only your life so you do not go to hell, but even your economic life. Every area of life will be blessed. If you will start to obey, how restore our relationship. Bring the tithe that you have been stealing, you have been robbing me. And so, you can see here, brothers and sisters, that this is God's condition for restoration of the broken relationship starts with hearing the message and repenting and identifying yourself with Jesus Christ who suffered and died by being buried with him in baptism and then after that you have to start obeying the basic command of God for a relationship with man and that is giving him what is due him what belongs to him that God set this as a sign of your obedience. Huwag mong kainin what does not belong to you. God has given you all the rest in your, in your garden that God has given you. He has given you 90%. Ang hiniling lang naman niya. What He is asking is only His share of 10% in tithes. To maintain and to restore and to maintain that broken relationship with God. Now, I'm not the author of this. This is God's word. He is the one talking for that matter. And this is a revelation from the very truth. This is not a theology from theological study from theologians because I'm not a theologian. I have not gone through theology. I'm only giving you the revelation Divine revelation by the Holy Spirit that has anointed me to teach you from the beginning of my calling when God called me until now and I will continue to do it to give you the divine revelations of the Word of God. So let us understand tithes and offerings is a condition of God for restoring and maintaining that broken relationship. With him. It is not only an exhortation for giving, as all the churches are doing. It is a condition made and laid down by God for us to restore and to maintain our relationship with Him until He comes to take us to glory. May God bless you all. If you understand this, pass it on to others. God bless you. In Jesus' name.